Acts chapter 3, verse 11. And as the lame man which was healed held Peter and John, all the people ran together unto them in the porch that is called Solomon's, greatly wondering. And when Peter saw it, he answered unto the people, Ye men of Israel, why marvel ye at this, or why look ye so earnestly on us, as though by our own power or holiness we had made this man to walk? The God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob, the God of our fathers, hath glorified his son Jesus, whom ye delivered up and denied him in the presence of Pilate, when he was determined to let him go. But you denied the Holy One and the just and desired a murder to be granted unto you and killed the Prince of Life, whom God hath raised from the dead, whereof we are witnesses. And his name through faith in his name hath made this man strong, whom ye see and know. Yea, the faith which is by him hath given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. And now, brethren, I would that through ignorance you did it, as did also your rulers. But those things which God before had showed by the mouth of all his prophets, that Christ should suffer, he hath, all, hath so fulfilled. Repent ye therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. And he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all His holy prophets since the world began. For Moses truly said unto the fathers, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren, like unto me. Him shall ye hear in all things whatsoever he shall say unto you. And it shall come to pass that every soul which will not hear that prophet shall be destroyed from among the people." Yea, and all the prophets from Samuel and those that follow after, as many as have spoken, have likewise foretold of these days. Ye are the children of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying unto Abraham, And in thy seed shall all the kindreds of the earth be blessed. Unto you first God, having raised up his son Jesus, sent him to bless you in turning away every one of you from his iniquities." As they spake unto the people, the priest and captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, bringing grieve that they taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. It's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It's the same God that you claim to worship. Jesus is not another God. He is the one true God of the Bible. He is the God that you claim to worship. He is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's the God of the living and not the dead. Amen. And He's God is the one who did this for that man. Jesus Christ did this for that man. We're not bringing a new God to you. That's the point. They, he wants them to know right off, we're not bringing a new God to you. The same God that you claim to worship, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, is the God that has done this, and His name is Jesus Christ. So they keep on preaching. The Bible says he's the God of our fathers and he has glorified his son Jesus whom you delivered up and denied him in the presence of Pilate. He was determined to let him go. He said, you delivered him up. Now watch this. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob has glorified his son. But then Peter gets right to the point and he said, you denied him. You delivered him up. You're the ones that murder the Christ of God. You get this? So he's putting it on them. Now the Bible says, as he's preaching this, this is very important for you to get because these statements that he's making is going to take you back to prophecy. When he talks about here in verse 13, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, hath glorified his son Jesus, whom you delivered up and denied, him and the prince of Pilate, when he was determined to let him go, said, You denied the Holy One and just one and desired a murder to be granted unto you. You killed the prince of life whom God raised from the dead, whereof we are witnesses. What he's doing is he's telling these people, these Jewish people, he said, he's letting them know this is the Messiah you were looking for. He is the Son of God. 
He's God come in flesh. And you took the Christ of God, you took the Messiah, you took the Son of God, and you crucified Him. You fulfill Bible prophecy. Isaiah 52, 53 talks about the servant of the Lord that would come. And so he's saying, you fulfilled that prophecy. You took the servant of the Lord and you crucified the Christ of God. You crucified the one that you were looking for. You crucified the one that was going to be sent to you, the sent one, that the prophets prophesied. And you took that one that was prophesied by the prophets and you delivered him up and you, you rejected him and you denied him. That very one that you were looking for was the one that you nailed to a cross. And so this is very important for us to understand. And he said, you denied the Holy One and the just and desired a murder to be granted unto you. He's the Holy One. He's the one that you were looking for. He's the one that the Bible talked about, the Messiah that would come. He's the just one. Let's go to Isaiah. In Isaiah 32, he's letting them know that this Jesus is the one who would fulfill prophecy. 32, 1. Behold, a king shall reign in righteousness, and princes shall rule in judgment. When the king comes, he's going to reign in righteousness. And Peter says here in Acts chapter 3, you, des you denied the holy one and the just one. You denied that righteous one that would come and reign in righteousness. Go to Zechariah 9.9. 9. Prophecy in the minor prophet Zechariah talks about the coming of the Messiah. Zechariah 9 and verse 9, it says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is what? Just and having salvation, lowly and riding upon an ass and upon a coat, the foal of an ass. So when Peter is telling them here in verse 14, you've denied that the Holy One and the just and desire to murder be granted unto you. He's taking prophecy and he's showing these people that this is the King of kings and Lord of lords. And he's the Messiah and he has come. He is the Messiah. These, these statements that are being made here are particular statements that are statements about the Messiah Himself. And He's letting them know by these statements that He's making that the very Messiah that the prophets distinguished as the just one and as the holy one, these are titles of the Messiah. He said, this one has come. And He says, you have denied Him. You have rejected Him. Amen. The Bible goes on and tells us in Isaiah 35 another prophecy about this coming Messiah. Isaiah 35, the Scripture tells us there that when He comes, miracles are going to break out all around Him. Isaiah 35, the Bible says, verse 3, Strengthen ye the weak hands and confirm the feeble knees. Say to them that are of fear, fearful heart, be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, even God with a recompense. He will come and save you. When God comes, watch what's going to happen. The eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap as an heart, and the tongue of the dung shall sing. For in the wilderness shall waters break out and streams in the desert. When the Messiah comes, this is what you can experience. You're going to see the lame man leaping as a heart, just like this man right here. You should know that this is declaring to you that the Messiah is come. And he's telling them when he came, they rejected him. Verse 15. You killed the prince of life, whom God hath raised from the dead. Now he calls him not only the holy and just one, but the prince of life. The prince of life. What does that mean, the prince of life? He's the author of life the originator of life. He is life within Himself. He is the one who is leading the rest of the people who will experience resurrection power. He's the Prince of Life. You put out the Prince of Life. You put this one out. This is a title of the Messiah. He's letting them know the Prince of Life has come. 
And you put him out when he came. The Bible continues. He says, you put him out. You put his life out. You killed the prince of life. You murdered him. You crucified him. God hath raised him from the dead. You love death. And that's why you killed him. You love death. That's why you killed the prince of life. Because you love death, you killed him. But he says, God raised him from the dead. Did you catch that? Because they love death, they kill him. But God raised him from the dead. So we have two sides of it here. We have what man did, and we have what God did. And these are all titles of the Messiah. There are seven of them total that are given here. You killed the prince of life whom God raised from the dead, wherefore we are witnesses and his name through faith in his name hath made this man strong. It's the name of Jesus that has made this man strong. It's faith in his name that has brought the results of this man to be strong here. It's not faith in your faith. It's not faith in or faith that says, I don't believe reality, mind over matter. It's a faith in Jesus Christ. There's a faith today that's out there in so-called Christendom. And it says, if you can only believe hard enough, you'll get your miracle. But we do not believe in existentialism. We do not believe in putting faith in our faith. You cannot work it up enough. You can't say, I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe. And because you keep saying you believe, or because you believe, make it happen. You don't make it happen by, what, by believing. You understand? Nor is it mind over matter that I go through life and I reject reality. That's Christian science. But there's some people, even in the apostolic movement, that believe in, and they wouldn't say they believe in Christian science, but they believe mind over matter. Or they believe in existentialism, which is faith in their faith. Or if I could just believe, yeah, I'll make it happen. No, you can't make it happen by what you believe. What you believe is what has already happened. It's what he provides. So your faith is not in your faith, and your, it's not mind over matter. Faith is in Jesus Christ. Faith is an object, and he is the object. And your faith is a response to that object, Jesus Christ. That's what biblical faith is. And so he says here, look at it. He said, and his name through faith in his name hath made this man strong, whom ye see and know. You know this man. You know for 40 years he's been laying at that gate. And he says, we'll tell you how it happened. You want to know how this happened? He said, we'll tell you how it happened. He said, it was in the name of Jesus. And he didn't. Now listen, the name of Jesus was not a theory to him. The name of Jesus was not a doctrine to him. The name of Jesus was a person to him. So that when they spoke the name of Jesus, they didn't just speak a theory. They didn't speak a magic formula. They didn't, just, they didn't speak a doctrine to that man. They, when they spoke the name of Jesus, they knew that Jesus was him. That his name was him and he was his name. When they spoke the name of Jesus, they knew that represented the person. So when they said, in the name of Jesus, the, in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, rise up and walk. It wasn't just magic. They, they were, it wasn't magic at all. They weren't working magic there. It wasn't a theory they were using. It wasn't a formula they were using. They knew that when they used the name of Jesus, that the presence of Jesus would be there. And as soon as they spoke that name, the presence of Jesus began to flow through that man's body. And it began to touch his bones. And it began to touch his muscles. So it wasn't just, it wasn't magic. It wasn't a theory. When you use the name of Jesus, you don't use it as a theory. You don't just use it as a doctrine. You don't use it as a magic formula. When we use the name of Jesus, we know that that is the person of Jesus Christ. And so when that name was used, that man was healed. Something happened when they said, in the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. When they stated that, this man who 40 years had been there in that, at that gate, beautiful, who could not get in the temple because he was lame. At that beautiful gate, there would have been a sign there that would say, no cripples allowed. 
No cripples allowed and no heathen allowed. No Gentiles allowed. He wasn't a Gentile. But no cripples would be allowed in that temple. And philosophers walked by and theologians walked by and religious people walked by. Priests walked by. But nobody could get that man in the temple. But the name of Jesus, the power of the resurrected Lord, got him at that temple. That one that you just killed a few weeks ago, this is the one that raised him from the dead. The one that you murdered on a cross is alive today. He rose from the dead, and because he lives today, when we spoke his name, this man came alive. Oh, y'all hear? Uh, this man, he was healed. This man had, had life come in his legs. This man was, had experienced a miracle because in the name of Jesus, they were declaring, Jesus is alive. The one you murdered. The one the prophets pointed to that, and, and called him various titles, the Messiah that was going to come. This one that you killed is the one that is alive his presence was there when we called his name, and he's the one. He is the one that raised that man up from that lame condition. And so Peter's taking this opportunity to preach to them. He said, let them know, you killed him. You did it. The one you were looking for, you killed him. But he didn't stay in the grave. He rose again the third day. And this man that's standing here, is a testimony to the fact that Jesus Christ is alive. The one you murdered. Now watch this. Verse 16, In his name, through faith in his name, hath made this man strong whom you see and know. Yea, the faith which is by him hath given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. And now, brethren, I would that through ignorance. He said, I know. He said, when he says, I what that through ignorance. He said, I know that you did it through ignorance. He said, I know when you killed the Christ of God and you murdered him. I know that you did it ignorantly. He said, I know you didn't know what you were doing when you did it. Now, that could not be said for everybody there in Israel. Because there were some people in Israel who knew what they were doing. You with me today? They had predetermined what they were going to believe regardless of the evidence. You hear what I'm telling you? So there were some people who knew what they were doing. But when Jesus was hanging on the cross, he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. So there were some who did not know what they were doing. Peter says, I know you did it through ignorance. You didn't really understand what you were doing, but I'm telling you what you did. You took the one that you were looking for, the Messiah, and you crucified the Christ of God. You took that holy one and that just one. You took the prince of life. You nailed him to a tree, and he's the one that's raised this man up so he could walk. Interesting, isn't it? But Peter says, I know you did it through ignorance. You didn't know what you were doing. Aren't you glad? For this message because I want to tell you this you need to remember this Jesus or God Jesus will come God will come to anyone but God will not come to everyone God will save anyone but God will not save any way God will receive anyone but he will not receive everyone. You have to come God's way. You can't just come anyway. Let me say it to you again. God will come to anyone, but he won't come to everyone. God will receive anyone, but he will not receive everyone. God will save anyone, but he will not save everyone anyway. You catch that? So when Peter begins to preach to this, what's he doing? He's going to bring them to a place where they recognize the only way they can be saved is through Jesus Christ. He's going to bring, he's putting conviction. The Spirit of God is convicting these people for what they have done. So the Bible tells us, he said, I know you did it through ignorance. 
as did also your rulers. That's very important. Because what he's fixing to do, he's fixing to say that what God has done for this lame man, 40 years old, who is a type of Israel, old Israel, who wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. He's preaching to old Israel here. And he's telling old Israel here that if you will believe like this man, you can be healed of your crippled condition. If you will believe like this man, you can be healed of your fallen condition. And Peter is fixing, he is fixing to offer the greatest offer that was ever offered. The greatest offer ever known to man. Because the murderers of Jesus Christ, whom Peter is preaching to at that moment. Y'all with me right now? He's telling you, telling them, I know you did it through ignorance. You wouldn't have, y'all here right now? You did it through ignorance. He's fixing to offer them forgiveness. The same Jesus that has healed this lame man. If you will believe like he did, you can be forgiven of all your sins. You can be forgiven for killing the Christ of God. God will take his blood and he'll wipe it all out. You with me? He's telling these people... He said, you know what, you deserve, really, they deserve to die. They should have been brought before the judgment of God. And they should have died for murdering the Christ of God. But Peter is bringing them before God Almighty and declaring that Jesus Christ is the one they were looking for. And if they would repent of their sin, and because they did it in ignorance, it's the greatest offer ever known to man, that God would offer forgiveness to the murderers of Jesus Christ. That he would take his blood and he would wash their sins away. Wipe it all away. Remove the killing of the Christ of God from their record. If they would just believe like that man. The same Jesus that caused that man to walk is the same Jesus that's offering these murderers forgiveness for their sin. It's the greatest offer ever known to man. It was offered directly to the murderers of the Christ of God himself. Isn't that amazing? They did it through ignorance. That's very important. Because in the Old Testament, sacrifices were provided by God for sins of ignorance. But no sacrifice was provided from God for presumptuous sins. Sins that they knew what they were doing when they did them. There was no sacrifice given for presumption, presuming on the grace of God. So I'm just going to sin, you know. I know it's wrong, but I'm going to do it anyway, and I'm willing to do it anyway, and I'm rebelling against God. There was no sacrifice made in the Old Testament for presumptuous sin. Sacrifice was given, though, for sins of ignorance. Are y'all with me right now? And the greatest presumptuous sin today is for you to die without Jesus Christ. To think that you could die without Jesus Christ and be saved is the greatest presumptuous sin that anybody will ever commit. And there is no forgiveness for that presumptuous sin. To think that you could die without Jesus Christ and be saved is presumption that will not be forgiven. Do you understand? So when he says, he said, I know you did what you did, and it was through ignorance that you did this. This is key, you understand, for them to experience the forgiveness of God. And I could go to the book of Hebrews, and I could show you that 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 even applies to the New Testament church. I don't have time to do that. I've already preached the book of Hebrews to you, but it it is in the Word of God. You can't just be presumptuous in your sin. You cannot reject Jesus Christ, reject the Holy Ghost, reject the blood of Jesus Christ and expect to be saved. Doesn't matter if you were in the church, in the past or not. You have to continue to walk with the Christ of God. You have to continue to live in the Spirit. You have to continue to, to live for the Lord Jesus Christ because if you don't, to presume that you'll be saved after living in sin is not forgiven. You understand? Because there's no forgiveness given to the unrepentant 
unregenerate sinner. You understand what I'm telling you? No repentance. No repentance is conditional for forgiveness. Is a condition for forgiveness. If you don't repent, you don't get forgiven. So to die unrepentant is presumptuous. To think that you're going to be saved anyway. So keep on walking with God. Keep appreciating what God has done for you. Keep a thankful heart. Don't let bitterness and, and, and the world get a hold of you and, and temptation pull you away from Jesus Christ because you could die and to presume that you would go to heaven in that condition. No, 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 no. The Bible tells us that the sins that were forgiven and sacrifices provided for were sins of ignorance. So don't ever forget that. Amen. So the Bible is telling us here now, he said, I know you did it through ignorance, verse 18, but those things which God before had showed by the mouth of all his prophets, that Christ should suffer, he had so fulfilled. You killed him. You fulfilled prophecy. God, it was in God's plan. It was in his plan. He knew you would do that. When the Christ of God came, he knew you would do that. And he used that to fulfill his purpose. Now watch this. He said, repent therefore and be converted. He said, if you, can, if you will repent of that sin of murdering Jesus Christ, if you can repent, if you can change your mind, change the way you think about Jesus Christ, change the way you look at him, change what you believe about Jesus Christ, he said, if you'll repent of that and be converted, if you'll have an about face, that's what the word converted means. It means have an about face. You're going one direction. He said, turn around. Have an about face. Turn around. Start heading the right direction. Change your mind about it. Jesus Christ. He said, if you will repent and be converted, he said, something's going to happen to you. He said that your sins may be blotted out. This takes you back to Acts chapter 2, verse 38. He, said, he preached there. He said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and you shall receive the remission of sins. So you, you will receive remission, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, right? Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. He had already preached that before. So now he's telling them again. He said, repent, be converted. Change your mind. Change the way you think about Jesus Christ. Make an about face. Repent and be converted. That your sins may be blotted out. That they can be wiped off. They can be washed away. The blood of Jesus will come in and wipe that scroll clean of your life. It will remove the blood guilt of the murder of the Christ of God from your hands. You talk about an awesome offer. You talk about a great offer from Jesus Christ. You think about it. If you took him and you nailed him to a cross, and then God offered you forgiveness, if you would repent repent, be, and make an about face and be converted, that your sins would be wiped, blotted out, wiped off like a scroll being washed clean, ready to be used again, ready to be written on again. This is the greatest offer ever made to man by God to even the murders of his son. The Bible says he'll blot out, if you will repent and be converted, he'll blot out those sins. He said, when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. You're in those times of refreshing. You're in the times of the early rain. He said, you can experience the refreshing from the drought. He's talking about spiritual refreshing. The Lord has come the first time. That's the early rain. He will come again. That's the latter rain. He's promising them though this refreshing that will come on their life. He's telling them this fresh refreshing. Listen to me. This word refreshing, the times of refreshing, literally means a breathing space. He said, I'm giving you a breathing space right now. He said, I'm giving you a period of time right now where you can be forgiven of all your sins in this breathing space. You can experience refreshing from the, the wrath of God Almighty. The heat of His wrath is upon you. But right now, He said, I'm going to give you a breathing space for you to repent. I'm going to give you a breathing space for you to be converted so that you can experience the times of refreshing or the times of a breathing space. I'll give you respite. I'll give you opportunity. I'll give you time. I'll give you the, the ability 
to make a change and to repent. But the Bible says, He shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive until the time of restitution of all things. He said, this Jesus has gone up into the heavens right now, and the heaven is retaining him. The heavens are retaining him until, until the times of the restitution of all things. Or the reformation of all things. He's letting them know that the heavens right now are retaining him, but he's going to come back at a specific time. And that specific time is the time of restitution of all things. Get ready for the kingdom age. He's telling them, get ready for the kingdom age to come. He's telling them to get ready for the new heavens and the new earth. He's telling them that when Jesus Christ comes back, he's going to restore everything back to what it was before the fall. But right now he's in the heaven, and the heaven's retaining him. It's holding him back until that time of the restitution of all things. This same Jesus is going to come back. You have an opportunity right now to prepare for the kingdom. You have an opportunity to be saved. And so the Bible says in verse 21 again, Whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all His holy prophets since the world began. He said those Old Testament prophets preached about the restitution of all things. They preached about the kingdom age. They preached about the new heavens and the new earth. They preached about the coming of Jesus and when He comes back, how He's going to restore everything back. But he said it's limited to what the prophet said. When you say restitution of all things, that doesn't mean he's going to restore the devil. It's limited to what the prophet said. See, there's some people today that will tell you that there is no such thing as hell. That that's an old church doctrine that we shouldn't preach anymore. They will, they will get, try to get you to believe that even the devil's going to be saved. That there is no hell, that God is going to restore the devil and his angels. They would even have you believe that God is going to restore unrepentant, unregenerate sinners. But the Bible does not, the prophets did not say that he would restore the devil and his angels. The prophets did not say that he would restore unrepentant, unregenerate sinners. So the restoration is limited to what the prophet said. You've got to get that because there's some preachers today that tell you that there is not going to be any hell. There's nobody going to be judged. Everybody's going to be saved. Even the devil's going to be saved. And his angels are going to be restored back to relationship with God. The prophets never said that. So the restoration is limited to what the prophets preached and what the prophets said. Hallelujah to the Lamb. So don't listen to the lies. Of some preachers today. Verse 22. Peter says. For Moses truly said unto the fathers. A prophet shall the Lord your God. Raise up unto you of your brethren like unto me. He said Jesus is the prophet. Another title for the Messiah. He is that prophet. That Moses pointed to. He is the prophet. That Moses pointed you to. Are y'all here? Watch. Watch this. There's fixing to be a great battle take place in the fourth chapter between the two nations. The old nation of Israel that was founded on Mount Sinai under the law, that old nation, and the new nation that was founded on the day of Pentecost that's under the Holy Ghost. And that old nation founded on Mount Sinai under the law is fixing to go to war with the new nation founded on the day of Pentecost under the Holy Ghost. There's fixing to be spiritual warfare like the world has never seen. When these two nations begin to fight, the old religious nation of Israel begin to fight the church of the living God. The spiritual warfare is fixing to break out. And he's telling them this. He said, he is the prophet that Moses pointed to. You with me? The law came by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Come on, are y'all here right now? And there's fixing to be great conflict over this. Jesus has fulfilled the ritual law of Judaism. He's fulfilled the ritual law. Hallelujah. And there's fixing to be a war between that old nation and this new nation that has come into existence. And so Peter's telling them that Moses wasn't the prophet. 
He was a prophet that pointed to the prophet, Jesus Christ. Come on, somebody. I don't have time to preach it to you, but Moses' life, look at his life. His whole life was pointing to Jesus Christ. He was the foundation of all the Old Testament prophets. He was a prophet. The Bible tells us that when Jesus would come, that Moses typified. He was a servant in the house. Jesus was the son over his own house. Moses typified, and he pointed to Jesus Christ. That's what Peter's letting him know. Moses said to you that there's a prophet that's coming, and he's just like me. Are y'all with me right now? He's like unto Moses. Moses typified him. He said, a prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren like unto me. Him shall you hear in all things whatsoever he shall say unto you. This Jesus is not only God come in the flesh. He's not only the Holy One and the Just One and the Prince of Life. He is also the prophet of the Lord. He's not going to bring a new God to you. He's not going to, come on somebody. It's not a new God. He's God. He's not a false prophet bringing a false doctrine. He is going to be the prophet of the Lord. He walked as a prophet. He spoke. Watch this. The prophets of the Old Testament said, the word of the Lord came unto me. When Jesus came to the world, he said, I say unto you. He was the prophet. He was different than the rest of the prophets. As a prophet, he walked in the earth. Are y'all with me? As a lamb, he died. As a priest, he rose. And as a king, he ascended up on high. He is prophet, priest, and king. And so Peter's telling him, he says, Moses said unto the fathers, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren like unto me. Him shall you hear in all things whatsoever he shall say unto you. You should, be, you should have listened to Jesus Christ. You should have listened to the Lord Jesus Christ. He was the prophet that Moses was talking about. This is the title of the Messiah. And you took that one that Moses prefigured and pointed to. And you killed him. Watch this. It's very interesting what he's preaching here. So he goes on and he says... 23. It shall come to pass that every soul which shall not hear that prophet shall be destroyed from among the people. So now Peter's focus of the message is this. That if you reject this prophet, if you reject Jesus Christ, the prophet that Moses pointed to, there's no hope for salvation. You cannot be saved Israel without Jesus Christ. Nobody can be saved without Jesus Christ. You reject Him and destruction is coming to you. That's what He's telling to these people who just got through killing the Christ of God, murdering Him on that tree. He's telling them that they should have listened to Him when He came, but they didn't. But He's the one. He's the Messiah. He's the one you were looking for. He was the one that was, was going to come. And so now, He's telling them if you reject Him, you have no hope of salvation. He said, It shall come to pass that every soul which will not hear that prophet shall be destroyed from among the people. You cannot be saved outside of Jesus Christ. Verse 24, he goes on. He says, Yea, and all the prophets from Samuel and those that follow after as many as have spoken have likewise foretold of these days, the days we're living in right now. These are the last days. He's already told them this. With the outpouring of the Holy Ghost on the day of Pentecost, that plunged the world into the last days. It plunged these people into the messianic kingdom that were born again of water and spirit. And so he's letting them know that the prophets, all the way back to Samuel, spoke of these days. The days that they were living in were prophetic. These days they were living in were fulfillment time. The Old Testament was the former days. These are the last days. And when the prophets preached, they talked about the last days. And Peter's telling them, you're in the fulfillment time that the prophets spoke of. They spoke in former days. Now you're in the last days. You're in the fulfillment time of what they said. When they talked about the last days, he said, you're living in them right now. The spiritual kingdom of Jesus Christ is come. And you've got the miracles and signs and wonders to prove that it's here right now. The Bible goes on and tells us, Samuel, all those prophets spoke likewise, foretold of what? These days. Verse 25, you are the children of the prophets. What does he mean by that? 
You're the children of the prophets. Does he mean naturally, physically? They're the children of the prophets. Were there people there that day that was the seed of Elijah or Isaiah or Jeremiah naturally? No, he's telling them, you are the children of the prophets because you, what he's saying is, you are the ones the prophets preach to. You are the nation that God sent the prophets to declare the truth to. You're the one that the prophets preached to and prophesied about these days. He said, you ought to have been looking for them. You should have been looking for them. You should have known they were going to come. You should have known it was going to be like this. You're the children of the prophets. You're the one that had the opportunity to hear those prophets preached. They preach to your fathers. You're the children of the prophets. You're the ones that had the opportunity to hear them preach. The Bible says of the covenant, and of the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying unto Abraham, and in thy seed shall all the kindreds of the earth be blessed. Who's he talking about? Is he talking about the natural seed of Israel? No, he's talking about the spiritual seed. The seed of Abraham, the seed of Abraham, according to Galatians, is Jesus Christ. The seed of Abraham is, the Jesus, is Jesus Christ himself, and those who are joined to Jesus Christ are the true spiritual seed of God Almighty. He's not telling these natural descendants of Abraham, these physical descendants of Abraham, that's, uh, th- that they're the ones that are, you know, are the seed of God. He's letting us know. It's those who are connected to the seed of Abraham, Jesus Christ. The word seed is singular. Jesus Christ is the seed of Abraham. And those connected to him are a part of the seed of Abraham. The Bible says in verse 26, Unto you first God, having raised up his son Jesus, unto you first, God, having raised up His Son, Jesus sent Him to bless you and turning away every one of you from His iniquities. This is why He came. He came to turn you from your iniquities. And if you would repent and be converted, if you would do an about face right now, and you would believe, change your mind about Jesus Christ. He's the one that the prophets prophesied about. He is the seed of Abraham. Come on, somebody. He is the one that you were looking for and you... He said, he'll take away your iniquities. He'll blot out your sin. He for, will forgive you if you'll be converted. Repent and be converted. And then at that point, brings me to the fourth chapter. And as they spake, remember they're preaching there in the temple precincts, the court of the temple. And all these people are gathered around there hearing Peter preach this message. And they, he's given seven different titles for the Messiah. And he's letting them know he was the one. And he's the one that you killed, but if you will repent and be converted, God will wipe it all out. I can hardly, really, it was hard for Peter, I think, as he stood there and preached to them, that hard for him to believe that everything this nation had that they would miss, the history they had that they would miss the coming of Jesus Christ. But they missed the coming of the one they were looking for because they got their history wrong. And they added traditions to the Word of God and their history being wrong and the traditions being added to the Word of God caused them to be blind to the reality of Jesus Christ when He came. In chapter 4, we got a problem now. I say we, it's not me, it's not you that have a problem. But that old nation's got a problem because they're the ones that crucified Him. But the offering of forgiveness had been given the Bible says that they spake to the people, the priest and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them. The priest, say the priest. And the captain of the temple. Who's the captain of the temple? This is the temple police. These people are the ones who are responsible to keep the, the temple sanctified. To keep it from being made unclean in any way. They were the temple police, the captain of the temple. He oversaw the police, those that made sure the temple was sanctified. And the priest, the priest at that time were Sadducees. And when we get into this chapter now, we begin to see the first persecution as a result of this miracle and this preaching. We see the first persecution on the church, and it comes from the religious world of the day. It comes from old Israel. It comes from that old nation. 
It comes from a group called the Sadducees particularly. In the days of Jesus in the Gospels, the Pharisees were the ones that were always involved in rejecting and attacking Him. And the Pharisees were involved in the crucifixion of Jesus. But when we get to the book of Acts, you don't see the Pharisees very often at all. When you get to the book of Acts, the enemy now that rises up against the body of Jesus Christ is the Sadducees. So the priests come in there, they hear Peter's preaching this message, you know, and they don't like it. And you got the police of the temple coming in on the scene. The Sadducees, the Bible says specifically, all gather and converge to begin to persecute the church of the living God. Y'all hear what I'm trying to tell you? The priests of that day were made up of Sadducees, Annas and Caiaphas. Annas was a priest for about 14 years. His relative Caiaphas took the place of high priesthood. Still alive at that day. Am I boring you this morning? The priest of that day, the chief priest and the high priest. High priest at one time, Annas. High priest became Caiaphas. And the chief priest under them were all a part of Annas' family. Sadducees. They were the priests of the day. They were in control of the priesthood. Who are these Sadducees? Who are these people that will persecute the church of the living God? Where did they come from? What is their history? What are they about? Well, the Bible says in Acts 23 and verse 8, the scripture itself tells you what they believed, or really what they didn't believe. He said in verse 8 of chapter 23, For the Sadducees say there is no resurrection, neither angel nor spirit, but the Pharisees confess both. These Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection from the dead. They did not believe in spirits. They did not believe in angels. That doesn't come from history. That comes right from your Bible. And you've got a resurrected Jesus on your hands. And Peter's preaching a resurrected Jesus. And they don't believe in the resurrection. And they're the ones who are in charge of the priesthood. Annas is a Sadducee. Caiaphas is a Sadducee. Who are these Sadducees? Where did they come from? What's their roots? Josephus is the first to make mention of them back in the time. He points back to the time, the Sadducees, Pharisees, and Essenes. He tells us that it was during that 400 years of silence between Malachi and Matthew. It was during the time of the Maccabees, around 200 years or so in that 400 silent years between Malachi and Matthew, uh, 200 B.C., the time of the Maccabees, Josephus lets us know that the Sadducees and the Pharisees and the Essenes existed. So these people came up at the time of the Babylonian captivity. But who are these Sadducees? How did they get in control of the priesthood here? They don't believe in the resurrection. They don't believe in spirits. They don't believe in angels. How did these people become a part of the priesthood. During that 200 years that Josephus mentions the Pharisees, Sadducees, and Essenes, the Zadok priest, who was the Aaron line, the line of Aaron, the Zadok priest of the Aaron line, 161 BC, migrated to Egypt and set up a rival temple in Egypt. And many believe at that time when the Aaronic priesthood transferred to Egypt that the Sadducees came on the scene and took over the priesthood. And that the Sadducees are not Aaron priesthood at all. So that Annas and Caiaphas, according to some scholars, were not even descendants of Aaron. The priesthood of Aaron had been had migrated to Egypt, 161 B.C. You can study that historically and find that to be a reality. So it could be that Annas and Caiaphas at that time, they're not even of the lineage of Aaron himself. How did they get in office then? They bribed their way in because these Sadducees were extremely wealthy. They were the wealthy class. They, they had great power because of their wealth. 
And they could bribe the Romans into putting them into positions so that the Annas and Caiaphas, the high priest of those days of Jesus and the days of the apostle, were men who bribed their way or bought their way into office. And many scholars today say they do not, they're not even a part of the Aaron priesthood. Some people, though, say that Sadducee is related to the priest Zadok, who was alive in the days of David. And if that's the case, then they are of the line of Aaron. But I think it's very interesting that nobody's really sure one way or the other who these Sadducees are. But we know by the Bible that they did not believe in the resurrection of the dead, they did not believe in the spirit or spirits, and they did not believe in angels. They were the rational religionists of the day. Say amen. They believed in the responsibility of man. They did not believe that God very rarely, if ever, intervened into the affairs of man. They believed man was responsible for his own actions, which is good, to a point. But they did not believe that God intervened in the affairs of man. They believed in the material world, the physical world. The things around them, not angels, not spirits, not an invisible world. They were rationalists, what they could see, what they could put their hands on, materialists of their day. That's what they believed. They were not like the Pharisees because the Pharisees believed in adding the traditions, the oral traditions of the elders to the law. The Sadducees says, we do not believe in the oral traditions of the fathers. So anyway, just to give you a brief idea of who these people are, they are very, very wealthy and they are very physically minded. They are not spiritually minded people at all. They're more, they're more a political group, really. But they do believe in that Old Testament. They do believe in the Old Testament to a point. We say, well, how could they believe in the Old Testament and not believe in the resurrection of the dead? Because to them, they didn't see the resurrection of the dead in the Old Testament. But this is who we're dealing with here. So the priests come, the chief rulers come, the rulers of the tribes of Israel, the Sadducees who are in control of the priesthood at that day, they come upon them at this time. And the Bible says in verse 2, being grieved that they taught the people and preached that are through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. Of course, if your whole doctrine and what you believe says there is no resurrection of the dead, and you got men standing up telling them that Jesus is resurrected from the dead, the one they just murdered. And this man is a miracle or a sign that he's alive. That goes against what they believe. It goes against their doctrine. So either the Sadducees got to go or the resurrection has to go. And they decided we're staying, but we got to disprove this resurrection bit. We've got to somehow prove that Peter and John are false prophets. We've got to prove that this miracle, this sign and wonder is a false sign and wonder. We have to prove that these men are trying to turn Israel away from the God of the Old Testament. And so that's what they set out to do. The spiritual warfare is intense. You've got religious people who do not believe in the supernatural. Oh, there's churches in the world today. There's churches in America today and all over the world today that do not believe in the, being filled with the Holy Ghost, speaking with other tongues. They don't believe in miracles, signs, and wonders. They don't believe in the Spirit. They don't. Come on, somebody. These Sadducees did not believe that when you died, your spirit went on, that when you died, your spirit died at that time. They didn't believe in a reward or they didn't believe in, believe in judgment that would follow after death. They didn't believe those things. There's churches like, just like them today that call themselves Christian. They don't believe in the supernatural outpouring of the Spirit of God. They don't believe in the gifts of the Spirit. They don't believe in healing. Come on, somebody. They don't believe in the reward of the judgment to come in the future. They're just like these old Sadducees. And they're sad, you see. So now we got a warfare breaking out. Everything they believe is being challenged by this group, this New Testament church. This old nation is fixing to have a confrontation with the new nation. The Bible says they were grieved that they taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. 
and they laid hands on them and put them in the hold until the next day, for it was now even time. Now, the Bible doesn't tell me if that lame man was put in prison with Peter and John or not. But let's just say that he went with them. You know, I just have a feeling that this lame man went with them because he will be standing with them whenever the Sanhedrin court is called to judge them, to see if they're false prophets or not. And that lame man will be standing with them. So if he stood with them on their judgment day, I believe that he probably was willing to go into prison with them, although it doesn't say he did, because he appreciated what God had done for him, and he appreciated those men. So he was, they were willing, he was willing to go to jail with him if he did go to jail. I do know he stood with them. Are you all with me right now? Kind of makes me wonder, though. You've got Peter and John, and we've got the lame man standing there before the Sanhedrin court. Where's the rest of the disciples? Why didn't they come and stand beside Peter and John on that day before the Sanhedrin court? Made up of those Sadducees and priests. And, you know, where are they at? They were cast in the hole in the prison until the next day. Thank God, at least they, they got a little bit of opportunity, you know. Jesus, they took Jesus immediately and condemned him to death. They tried him through the night. At least his disciples, they gave them an opportunity to sleep through the night. They probably didn't sleep much, but until the next day, they didn't have to face the Sanhedrin court. The Sanhedrin court was made up of 71 people, 70 rulers and priests, one high priest sitting at the front, sitting in a semicircle, a half circle, with the priesthood, the high priest at the, at the front or the head of it. They would bring their councils together in the temple in a place called the, uh, the Chamber of Hewn Stone. And Peter and John and the lame man walks in the next morning. The high priest in the, the Sanhedrin court, 70 plus 1, sitting there ready to judge any false doctrine that is creeping into the nation of Israel sitting there in the chamber of hewn stone. They bring Peter and John and this lame man and they stand them before them. Jesus had stood there a few months before, a few days before, 40 days after His resurrection, 50 days. So, you know, some time has gone by here. A couple of months ago, Jesus had stood before these same people. He had stood before Annas before the same ones that condemned Jesus to death are where these disciples are going to stand verse 4 good news how be it many of them which heard the word believed and the number of the men was about 5,000 people that night when Peter and John were in prison there's 5,000 people getting baptized in Jesus' name and getting the Holy Ghost. He already had 3,000 people as a result of his first sermon. Now you got 5,000. I don't know if that's two, two more thousand added to the three equaling five or if it's 5,000 more added to the three bringing it to eight. It really doesn't matter to me. I sort of believe it was 5,000 more on top of the 3,000. So within a short period of time, if you can imagine, within a short period of time, we got 8,000 believers in Jerusalem. In a short period of time, 8,000 men, besides women. 8,000. Jerusalem is small. It'd be like if revival hit Odessa, Texas. In a few short months, 8,000 people came into this church. Jerusalem is small. It's a beehive of believers now. They're everywhere. They're in the temple preaching. They're on every street corner. The devil doesn't know what to do with these people. They're preaching the resurrection of Jesus Christ. They're in union with the head. They're part of the body of Jesus Christ. They're everywhere. They are a beehive in a small, small part of the world. Wow. 
8,000 men plus five. It came to pass on the mall that their rulers and elders and scribes got them all together. We got the Sanhedrin court, these 71. He says, you got the rulers, that's the leaders of the 12 tribes, the elders, the scribes. And as the high priest and Caiaphas and John, we have the name of the high priest, Annas and Caiaphas. These are the Sadducean high priest, or Caiaphas is at that time. Annas is sort of like behind the scenes. He once was a high priest. All of the priests at that time were related to Annas. They were part of his family. They had the money to buy. They had the money to buy the position. The Bible says these rulers and Caiaphas and Annas, John and, John and Alexander don't really know who these guys are. And as many as were of the kindred of the high priest, look at that, the kindred of the high priest were gathered together at Jerusalem. They are his relatives. He got one big family, you know, the priesthood, the Sanhedrin court, Sadducees. And they're all sitting around in that semicircle, and they're going to judge. They're going to bring judgment on Peter and John. And Peter and John's going to have, Peter's going to have to preach for his life. Because if he can't prove his point, if he can't prove that Jesus Christ is risen from the dead, if he can't prove his point, he's preaching for his life, they're going to take Peter and John out and they're going to murder them for bringing a false doctrine and a new God to Jerusalem. The Bible says, verse 7, when they set them in the midst, they asked, by what power or by what name have you done this? Notice, they didn't say, hmm, we heard that you used the name of Jesus. They didn't even want to give any recognition to his name at all. Let me tell you something about these religious people here today that we're talking about that had gathered there at that Sanhedrin court. They had the authority, the final authority of their day. They had great power. Great power and authority. The only thing they couldn't do, they could pass sentence on you, but they could not kill you. If you were guilty of a crime worthy of death, they could pass the sentence on you, but they'd have to trust the local governor of Rome to condemn you to death. But other than that, they had absolute authority in the nation. They were the Supreme Court of Israel. They were the religious authority in the land. They were the civil authority in the land. And they were the spiritual shepherds, spiritual shepherds of Peter and John. So they are the religious authority, the civil authority, and the spiritual authority in all the land. And what they say is absolute. They have the final say-so, and they are the ones who have the authority in that land. The council, the Sanhedrin court. And so, here comes Peter and John standing before the Sanhedrin courts. These men of authority. Looking at these men who are Jews, they themselves being Jews. The spiritual warfare is about to take place. The two nations are about to collide. There's fixing to be a warfare like the world seen. And it's going to bring about the first persecution of the church of the living God. Not by the people of the world out there, but by the religious world within. See, the church's problem is never really out there. It's not there. It may at some point become political. Later in history, it became the political, the government against the church. But right now, I'll tell you, the, the problem in the, is not with the world out there. We don't have a problem with the world out there. We've got a problem within the church. We've got a problem with religious flesh. That's where the problem is. And so now Peter and John is standing in the midst of these rulers with authority. The ones whom Jesus Christ their Lord stood before. And the Bible says, that same place, Ooh, glory to God. By what power or by what name have you done this?
judgment is fixing to be passed on them as to whether or not they're false prophets. Are you bringing a new name? Are you bringing a new God? Are you bringing a new power with you? Who did, how did you do this? And so Deuteronomy 13, turn there please. Let me show you what I'm talking about. That Old Testament Bible talks to us here. What's going on there? The scripture says in verse 1 of Deuteronomy 13, He said, If there arise among you a prophet or a dreamer, Peter's a prophet, John is a dreamer. And giveth thee a sign or a wonder. There's the lame man. And the sign or the wonder come to pass. Whereof he spake unto thee, saying, Let us go after other gods which thou hast not known, and let us serve them. Thou shalt not hearken unto the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams, for the Lord your God proveth you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. You with me? Verse 5 tells you what you do with that false prophet and that false dreamer. It's trying to turn you away from the true God, from that one true God. He said he will be put to death. So we got a prophet here by the name of Peter, and we got a dreamer by the name of John standing before this Sanhedrin court, and they're gonna start, they're gonna have to preach for their life. They're gonna have to prove their point that they're not trying to get Israel to go after another God. Jesus is that God. They're going to have to prove their point that Jesus rose from the dead. They're going to have to prove their point that they're not bringing false doctrine into Israel to turn the hearts of Israel away from a false God. By what power or by what name have you done this? The judgment's on. The trial is set. The lame man standing there with him. Then Peter filled with the Holy Ghost. Filled with the Holy Ghost. Empowered. Filled with the Holy Ghost. He knows something supernatural is going on in him. He knows what he's about to say is not going to be coming from his own mind. He knows what he's about to say is going to come from the Holy Ghost. It's going to come from the Spirit of God Almighty. He's going to be preaching for his life. He's going to look them right in the eyeballs. He's not going to say, I think it happened this way. He's not going to say, maybe he's going to tell them, this is the way it is. And when the Holy Ghost comes on Peter, all that Sanhedrin court can do is sit there in silent amazement. Because they know when Peter gets through, when he starts preaching, they know Annas and Caiaphas know they paid those soldiers off to lie about his being stole from that tomb. They know they did that. They know, Caiaphas knows Jesus stood before him and said, there's coming a day when you shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power Hallelujah. coming in the clouds Hallelujah. of glory. Hallelujah. You're going to see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power coming in the clouds of glory. He's making reference to himself as the Son of Man. And he's pointing Caiaphas back to Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7 talks about the Son of Man sitting upon His throne in His kingdom. He said, you're going to see the Son of Man sitting on the right of hand in power coming in the clouds of glory. And the Bible says, Caiaphas rent his clothes. He broke the law and condemned his own self when he did that. He said, this man commits blasphemy. He's a blasphemy. No, he's the Son of God that Daniel prophesied about. He is the one that is going to come in the right hand of power and, and clouds of glory. This is Jesus. Oh, Caiaphas had already been confronted by this Jesus that Daniel 7 talked about. He 
so the Bible says, Peter filled with the Holy Ghost said unto them, Ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel. And I want you to see something beautiful about Peter. Even though these men right here. I want you to see, look at this. Look at the response to the greatest offer that was ever given to man. That they, that they could have their sins blotted out if they would repent and be converted. You know what their response was to that message? Take them and throw them in prison. And now, try them for blasphemy. You with me today? Isn't that sad? How many people do you know today bring, you bring the gospel to them and they outright reject it? I mean, they, they'd throw you in jail if they could. They, they just got that they're full of hatred toward the gospel. Peter filled with the Holy Ghost said unto them, you rulers of the people and elders of Israel, this Peter, listen to me, he's not going to defend himself. He's going to preach Jesus Christ. Never one time does he defend himself. He's going to preach Jesus Christ. You with me so far? Yeah, he's going to preach for his life. He's a filling of the Spirit. He's full of the Spirit. He said, verse 9, if, if we this day be examined of the good deed done to the impotent man by what means he is made whole, be it known unto you and all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom he crucified. He said, you killed him. The one you killed, the one you murdered a few days ago, is alive. And this lame man is proof. See, we told you he's alive. Look. He's the proof that he's alive, that he's risen, that he's the true king, that he's brought in the spiritual kingdom, that we're a part of a new nation. All they can do is sit there in quiet amazement. He doesn't get unsubmissive, but he cannot obey them. Peter, in his epistles, wrote more about submission than any other New Testament writer. But he said, I'll submit to you, but I can't obey you. I'll serve you. That's submission, but I can't obey you. Listen to me. He starts preaching. He said, it's the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised. Oh, he raised him from the dead. And they knew that these people didn't even believe in a Holy Ghost. They were materialists. They didn't believe in the Spirit. They didn't believe in divine intervention. And they didn't believe in the resurrection of the dead. So you can imagine how they must feel. I mean, they murdered him, and he's, and he's risen from the dead. And, and everything they believe, everything they've taught, is being confronted right there. Yeah. Hallelujah. How many people say, we don't believe in Acts 2.38. We don't believe in repenting, be baptized in your name, and be filled with the Holy Ghost. We don't believe in speaking in tongues. We don't believe in miracles. We don't believe. We don't believe. We don't believe. Sadducee. You're a Sadducee. All you got is religion, and you love your religion. You don't love God Almighty. You love your religion. Now, let me talk to you apostolic Pentecostals. You can get in a position where you love your religion and not love your God. And you know how I pastor you. I am never pointing you to a denominational system because I don't want you to love your religion. I want you to love your God. Hallelujah to the Lamb. They're standing before the religious elders of their day. 
They're standing before their spiritual shepherds. Their spiritual shepherds. They are standing before the civil, religious, and spiritual authority in Israel. And Peter begins to preach, and he tells them, you killed him. You crucified him, but God raised him from the dead. <laughs> and I, I just I'm, can imagine how, boy, you ain't starting to get nervous now. They're probably squirming on the pews and looking at each other, you know. I mean, what are you going to do? you got a miracle standing right beside them. And it's a notable miracle. Who can deny it? And why would you want to deny it? They should have never asked that question by what name or power. They should have never asked that question. Let me tell you something. They made some huge mistakes here. They made a mistake when they arrested them. They made a mistake when they asked them the question by what power or name. They should have never done that. Okay? They should have just left him alone. Verse 10, Be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you whole. It's awesome, isn't it? How dare them stand up like that to the Sanhedrin court, to the religious authority of the day? How dare they? Do you understand what I'm telling you? This religious court is going to tell them to not preach in the name of Jesus. And they're going to have to say, we're going to obey God, not man. If religion ever comes to you and tells you, we don't believe in Acts 2.38, tell them, we ought to obey God rather than man. If your husband comes to you and tells you, I don't want you to be baptized in Jesus' name, we ought to obey God rather than man. But he's my authority. God is your authority. Jesus Christ is your authority. That old pagan husband says, I don't want you to be baptized in his name. He said, see you later. I'm going with or without you. I mean, you can keep a right spirit. I don't want to get you in trouble or beat up. So I love you, husband. I love you. I love you, you know. You're my husband and everything. But I'm obeying God. That old pagan wife puts pressure on you. Says, you get baptized in his name. You start going to that church. I'll quit you. And you'll just have to quit me. Because I'm going to obey God rather than me. Well, I, I have to obey my pastor even if he's wrong. No, you don't. No, you were taught that. That's not right. You have to obey your pastor. You submit to him. You keep a right spirit toward your pastor, but you don't have to obey him if he's wrong. God is your spiritual head. Do you hear what I'm telling you? Hallelujah to the Lord. Okay. So, well, my pastor told me to do it, so I had to do it. I know it was wrong, but I had to do it. No, you don't either. You submit, you keep a right spirit, but you don't have to obey wrong. In fact, if you obey wrong, God's going to hold you responsible for that. Give the Lord praise in this house. Oh, there's a lot of religious institutions in the world today that are like the Sanhedrin court. You go stand in front of them, they'll crucify you. Keep a right spirit, serve you in love, but I can't obey you. He said, verse 11, he said, Peter said, keeps on preaching. This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. He said, Peter preaches up, picks it up, Psalm 118. He, he picks up a prophecy in Psalm 118 that tells us that the stone would be rejected of the builders. And he says Jesus was the stone. He said, you remember that stone back in the days where the temple was built? And I think it was Solomon's, and I'm not really sure on the history of that, but I believe it was Solomon's temple. There was a stone that the builders looked at and said, this stone is of no use, get rid of it. And they took it and they cast it down the hill. 
And when it came time for them to set the cornerstone, no stone that they could find would work. And they went and they got that old useless stone that they had thrown away and said was not, it wasn't, it's not in our plans. It's not in our plans. It's, it's useless to us. They found that stone that they said was not in their plans and was useless to them was the only stone that would work for the corner. And Peter said, he's the stone. He's the capstone. He's the cornerstone of the whole building. And you didn't want him. You didn't put him into your plans. And you thought he was useless. But he is the chief cornerstone of God Almighty. He's the one that the church is going to be built on. Not Moses, but Jesus Christ. Oh, my. Boy, you just got to put yourself in. You, I want to take you, if I can, in the, in the spirit right now to put you there before the Sanhedrin court. And just see how quiet they are. Do you realize all they had to do was send somebody that instant down to that old tomb? All they had to do was provide the body of Jesus Christ and the conversation would be over and Peter and John would be stoned to death for bringing a false prophecy. Why didn't they jump up and run down there to that old tomb and get the body of Jesus? Because the body of Jesus, and they knew it. The body of Jesus was not there. <laughs> so you know they're really, they're, oh man, they're, they're nervous as, as a cat in a room full of rocking chairs. You see, their quiet response is one of the greatest proofs of the resurrection. Did you hear what I said? Because if anybody could prove that Jesus had not risen from the dead by getting his body, it would have been them. But they couldn't find the body because the body wasn't there. He had risen from the dead. Oh, I'm telling you, the, their silence is the greatest proof of the resurrection of Jesus. You can go. Yeah, this is the stone which is set up not of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Woo! Glory to God, man. You, I guarantee you they're under conviction now. And then he says in verse 12, Neither is there salvation in any other. You cannot get to God. You cannot know God outside of Jesus Christ. The only way to get to God, the only way to know God is Jesus Christ. Neither is there salvation. Listen, he's telling them, you cannot be saved. You're religious. You claim to be the priest. You're the, claim, you're the spiritual shepherds of us. You are the religious authority and you are the civil authority and the spiritual authority of all the land. You have power and authority what you says goes and people obey what you tell them. But you cannot be saved without the one you murdered. And be it known that God raised him from the dead. You don't even believe in the resurrection of the dead. And you don't believe in the spirit, but the spirit has intervened and, and killed this man. And that message to them is a message for the whole world. Neither is there salvation in any other. Any other. You cannot be saved by Moses. You must be saved by Jesus. Moses pointed to him. Moses was a servant in his house. Jesus was the son over his house. He, he's, he's God. This is the stone which was set at not of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. And who gave the name? God gave the name. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name. Oh, look at this. No other name. 
The saving power of God is in the name of Jesus Christ. That's why we baptize in the name of Jesus because the name of Jesus is the only name that brings salvation. This is the only way you can get to God, to know God, to be saved. The name of Jesus because the name of Jesus is the person of Jesus Christ. Neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. God gave the name. He is Jesus Christ. He is the Savior of the world. Wow. You religious leaders cannot be saved without Him. But the offering is there. The offering is there. If you will repent and be converted... But I will tell you that on all the Bible, you will have Pharisees that come into the kingdom, but not one Sadducee in all of the Bible ever went, came to Christianity. I'm not saying there never was one, but I'm saying in the Bible, you have no record of a Sadducee ever coming into Christianity. Not one. They, they're satisfied with their religion. They predetermine what they're going to believe and you cannot change their minds. Verse 13. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, say the boldness. And it doesn't mean they just, they saw the courage of these men. It means when they heard the clarity of their speaking. Okay? They, they knew there was some power behind what he was saying and, and they could discern the clarity of what he was saying.